Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today's presentation is part of the Culture Builds Communities webinar series. This community-based project is designed to help Native communities plan and develop cultural facilities. Culture Builds Communities is a project of the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Major funding is provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Museum of the American Indian, and Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Thank you so much for being here today, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, appreciate being here. Welcome everyone. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy and uh, wearing your mask to help our community stay healthy. It's very important. And uh, so today we are going to talk about, uh, you know, a new facility. And if we were together, what this, this talk is really about is we would wander through as many facilities as possible. And I did not just museums that have native materials, but art museums, history museums, house museums. And I'd ask people to walk through those spaces and just chat with one another to talk. And so the talk, so my presentation today is based around that idea of how that feels of walking through and, and getting people to focus in on some of the intangibles of, uh, of, of the world. So um, one of the things we're going to do today, you know, is talk about uh, this planning for this facility, and it provides an opportunity uh, to assess what you're going to build now, what the future might be for it, and what will the new facility spark for the community? Will it spark type of growth? Will it, will it sit by itself, be isolated from the community? How about staffing? If you're already established, you're going to build a new building, and does it serve as a site for programs, new programming? How about collections, expanding collections? Do you add technology for online content? What about collections care itself? And we're gonna look at today kind of museum functions and staffing and space, considerations for a facility for developing exhibits, acquiring collections and growing public programs and launching initiatives of hiring and training staff and reviewing and revising policies and procedures. Now, because we're gonna talk in a less uh, overt way about these things, we're gonna try and step through some facilities and understand what museums look like now, what some tribal museums look like now, what you're kind of thinking about in your community, how to get that, those ideas out. So I put up a few things, you know, one of the ways, so up here in this corner here, uh, you know, that's the Denver Art Museum. And, uh, you know, it's a native piece out front, uh, uh, Edgar Hickerbert's uh, piece, and it's, uh, it doesn't dominate the, the um, it announces something about native presence in Denver and, and for the museum itself, but it's not overtly in your face uh, in, a, in a way. You get up close to its very powerful piece. This is the Southern Ute Center down here in this corner. And again, it's, it's very much native in its intent. You know, Octavius is sitting here in the middle of Zuni country here. And I, I think this is a great uh, second shot here that if you look at this, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. But if you look at this up in the corner, which is hidden under all the images of people, that's the Zuni uh, Tribal Museum. That's it, uh, quite different. And then this problem here in the middle between them is this Ashui or Zuni pot on display. This is how so much of the outside world perceives or understands native communities, let's see. So you think about an image, I was director and chief curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. We tore down a building and rebuilt the building. We tried to get people focus on that in some ways. And one of the things one of my predecessors did was he put this Craig Gossiun, 25 or 30 foot tall gone dancer in the front. And as this woman is showing you, that's all people see, that's what they talk about. They identify the place as uh, the place with the big dancer, big sculpture in front. It's a great piece, there's nothing wrong with that but your choices do a lot. And I put this photo by Montague Russell up here. So um, we use this for uh, announcing and as the primary image for the here, now, and always uh, permanent exhibition we put into the museum. It was a 10 year project with lots and lots of people from the communities. It was a first of its kind exhibition that, that really took community collaboration from the beginning and used it. And, and our marketing department in the Museum in Mexico was very much against the photo because it didn't represent native people. I thought the only problem with the photo was he's hitting off his front foot, which is not very good for a long 
a long ball for him. But we persisted and used that image. I think it was the right image to use. Perhaps it surprised some people. For other people, it's like made a lot of sense. So this sort of idea of, of shifting from being curiosities, we're talking about to the outside world, you know, the, this idea of native people's curiosities and just shifting the gaze. And what I mean by shifting the gaze is like, uh, these are people just like everybody else. They have things they want perhaps to tell us through their facilities and so forth. What types of things do you tell through the facility? So this is a sort of shifting gaze, you know, I think these are people selling pottery by the roadside here in New Mexico. This is up in Maine, she's selling baskets. This is the way that most people see or know native people. Even today with Indian market and other art fairs and so forth, uh, the types of things that museums do in terms of uh, artists and so forth. So it's, it's not a horrible thing. At least people have contact and great things could come out of that. Uh, but uh, that is the sort of thing. The other challenge is that, so this is Akama here with the ladder going up into one of their ceremonial houses. Uh, how does this public building, the cultural center, the Sky City Cultural Center, represent this? How does the cultural center represent the ceremonial houses and the Sky City itself, but keep it private at the same time? So these are, each community has, has very specific questions it needs to sort of ask itself. And, and I think when you walk through these facilities, to think about how did that community, how did the Akama community um, hear, understand itself and present itself through this public facility? Uh, so the real question I think is this, you know, museums and native people have never had a really good relationship. It's always been very uh, contested. And so, you know, so you say, oh, we're gonna build a museum here in the community. And everybody says, what, a museum? Why do we want that, you know? Um, but they are contested spaces. They could be inaccessible heritage for communities. And it's history of the community. It's your culture removed from the community. So overcoming those obstacles is important. And I think one of the things about uh, museums is, uh, so if museums are problematic elsewhere, there's a standard reason they're going to be problematic at home, meaning are you going to import what museums do, or the sort of imaging of museums, bring it into the middle of the community, or are you going to make things happen in a different way that people see it as their place, uh, a, a museum rethought, redone? And these are just three ideas. So this is all pottery in different places. So here's pottery, you know, on these metal shelves and the stickers there. And it looks dusty, and it was very dusty. This is up in the Bronx in about 1995, before we moved these collections to, to Washington. Um, you know, same pottery here. This is Museum of the Arts and Culture. You know, she's walking down the aisle. You can see it's still metal shells. It looks better. It's more respect, respectful towards the materials. There are all these foam rings. And then this is a school for advanced research, their Indian Arts Research Center. And it is gorgeous. There is no doubt about it. But everything's still on shelves, still somewhat away from you not with you. So the idea that you have different ways of presenting pottery, but really the same problem of the uh, detachment of the pottery from people is happening in all these places. So I put this thing together. I put this thing together to sort of uh, lead into uh, reading a catalog record. You know, what, what, who is inside the museum and what they do. So I've listed some of the people associated with this catalog, or this is an actual catalog card from the National Museum of the American Indian. This was part of the Museum of the American Indian, the originator uh, who the Smithsonian uh, uh, brought the collections and created a museum around, around uh, this museum's history. And so you've got this card. Not everybody uses cards anymore. This is a three by five card in you know, like a library uh, uh, drawers. And this, car, and this card tells you that it's a flute, it's inlaid with lead. That's a lot of information for a card like this. It usually might say flute uh, and not tell you that it's inlaid with lead. And then it uses this word here, which is not usually the accepted word. There's so many different groups of Ojibwe people now. It tells you the data it's collected and it tells you this guy, Julius Carlsbach. So registered, so now looking at the different components in the collections area of the museum. So in the registration, they keep this record. 
and they produce the card to record the data. They put the number on the objects so we track. In work at NMAI, registration was responsible for making written records and making them into an electronic catalog. Now, archives down here, they're photo and paper. They're additional records. They're the primary records. Because let's say this guy, whoever this who collected this in 1857, had a letter about, oh, I visited so-and-so today at such and such a place, or as by Duluth, or as by this place or that place. It'll give you clues, maybe, if not specific information. Now, the collections managers, who mostly we deal with when we go into museums, uh, because they put things on the shelves, they keep them there, there's pest management, they help researchers and travel visits. You know, they really know a lot about the collections because they're there listening to people uh, uh, and they're exchanging information with people as well. And they're also providing something called cultural care. And that has to do with the community's own decisions about perhaps how things would like to be cared for in the museum. Conservators, they provide care for the objects. Uh, and uh, there is a big changing sort of group that's, that's working now and, and working with Native people that understand how Native people want the objects to be preserved or not preserved. There's a lot of collaborative research and their work is recorded in a database as well as with registration. And they have close contact with objects. They're working with people. There's a lot of materials research. It can be a real resource. Now a curator, uh, they're the person who ostensibly knows what 1857 means. And they know that Julius Karlbach was a, a dealer on Madison Avenue in New York City uh, between 1930 and 1966, and uh, how he's a, uh, uh, he can be a, a complicating figure. It's also the curator is also the partner with Ojibwe people in the sense of changing the spelling, trying to decide if it's from one particular Ojibwe community or not. I think the job of a curator now is to complicate. And I mean complicate in the sense of, look how simplistic this card is compared to the information that might be available. So if I'm thinking about, uh, if I'm thinking about what is inside a museum and why, so now we're walking through, right? So these are the sort of things I might say or ask you to think about as we uh, walk through the museum and how we enter the museum. So um, importance to you, what, is there importance to your planning and facility in terms of the museums that we're looking at? Uh, and what are the cultural values and how will those cultural values fit into your facility? And um, you know, you're working with a program to program you, and what I mean by that, the community, and not just another building and museum. You're not building a monument, you're not trying to duplicate something else, but you're programming with yourselves as a community to create something that ref that it reflects yourself and of the community that people feel like it's there. You've got to decide what the community wants. Maybe there's people who don't want a cultural center or a museum, or they want a cultural center or a museum. Uh, so that's the second question. Same thing. It's just is uh, is there is there such a thing as a cultural center for your community, and what is it going to be for? What kind of bottom line, you know, is it? Is it going to be for visitor education, control of visitors? Is it for community and community members? Is a facility going to collect? Are you going to bring items home? Cultural patrimony and, and NAGPRA. So, so as you're walking through a facility, you see how they're handling these things. And just physically in the space, how people are handling some of these questions, as well as talking to people like the collections managers and the curators. How are you handling these things? How are these decided? How do you decide? That goes on this shelf or that shelf. Who are you talking with? What types of knowledge can you share with us? So this is classic. This is what we think museums look like. Uh, and uh, the photo on the left has, is from Arizona State Museum and they have done a magnificent job in rethinking their collections. They've also got the things out of the plastic bag so things can breathe properly. Uh, the things are off the wood shelves which can attract pests and so forth. The collection, unfortunately, on the uh, right-hand side, the Santa Ana pot with the other pots crowding it, that really hasn't changed much. That's a collection in New York. Uh, this is also just our classic view, you know, this guy leaning on the shelves and opening drawers here and there, just an endless row of drawers, uh, um, 
Um, and then this other side, uh, shoe boxes uh, filled with archaeology. That's what this is. Um, think how many pairs of shoes that is, how long it took to collect those shoe boxes. Shoe boxes have can be dated, but inside are ancestral, not remains of people, but all the other pieces that come out of excavations. So then, uh, and then this, so and then this photo down here, the baskets down here, uh, mostly Chumash from around the Santa Barbara area in California. When you look at these baskets, then um, they're on shelves. They're they're they've all got tags on them. You can see the tags with barcodes. So they can be located and so forth. It's a pretty good job. It's a redo of collections at the, the National Museum of Natural History, Anthropology Department. Uh, but it still lacks some place. There's something about it, the feeling. But this is the point when in our discussion, I would turn back to you all and say, how do you feel? You know, and somebody in the group uh, would, would probably say, well, I, I, the baskets are feeling X way or this or that. Can we touch them? You know, those types of things. So n having a discussion based around your experiences in other places is a great uh, uh, tool that you have. Just another picture of things. There's a lot of things complicated about this, about this shot, you know, uh, you know, the kind of makeshift way these are old hat boxes being used to store things. Over here, the bowls are upside down, right? Uh, you know, the difficulty of that, again, metal shells, the tags, you basically see the green shells, you don't see much else. If we were in here too, I'd point out that you don't have enough space on the bottom in case there's a flooding problem. You need six to 12 inches along the bottom here. Uh, things are also sorted. This is another issue that things are sorted here according to uh, size as well as um, the site of these ancestral places. Um, I wonder if Native people would, would agree with that sorting of things. Uh, this, I wanted to bring these into view. Uh, again, I brought this up a little bit. Um, I have no idea what those little yellow squigglies are, but those are nice. Um, but this is, these are newer facilities. These are improved storage. And what I mean by that is that they've done a lot of work to bring things around and make them better and all the rest of that. And, they, and they've worked hard uh, uh, on doing that. And so you can see the, like the pottery in here, the pottery is uh, at Virgil Ortiz, and this looks like a, a Luan de Foya piece, you know, an older San Domingo piece, these two, Robert Tenario. Um, so they've grouped Pueblo pottery together. Uh, and over here, the baskets again, are on much better circumstance. The shelves are padded. They've got this little lip on them so they can't roll off if there was some type of earthquake situation. Museums have really tried to do a lot with the collections that is much more respectful than, than uh, the circumstances they came out of. But I still would ask people, how does this make you feel? What about this? Uh, the other thing is, so to see these collections, we walk down into the basement. Let's imagine we walk down into the basement. How does it feel that? Uh, you walk down the basement and there's a uh, ring of keys and somebody has to open the door to let you in. Uh, what does that feel like to be in a separated space from the rest of the museum facility? So I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, NMAI, uh, National Museum of the American Indian. I was part of the senior staff there. I was responsible for the research and collections uh, for the museum for 10 years. And part of my responsibility was opening and operating, developing the operating principles uh, for the Cultural Resources Center, which is about 15, 20 minutes from the Mall Museum. And this is the home of collections and research. It is purpose-built, meaning it was built for the collections. It was designed around the collections. It's clearly not a square building, but a nautilus-shaped building. You walk along this path here, you come into the door, which faces to the east right here. It's built to honor and be a dignified home uh, for the collections. You can also see this road here. On the other side of this road, as those of you who've been to Washington and looked at collections, that's the anthropology facility and the museum support center, which are five pods, each pod about the size of a football field uh, with three stories in each of them. Um, 
very different ideas about the collections being alive versus collections being specimens or artifacts. Uh, and that's the way that was built. When we built this, you know, uh, I wasn't there for the first, very first part of NMAI, but Rick West told me, you know, they wanted it attached to the other building. He said, no way. He actually said, no effing way uh, would he attach anything at the college. He wanted a standalone facility. A great decision, really important decision uh, for the museum. Um, and this is the entrances, how you come into the museum here. I mean, to the Cultural Resources Center, I'm sorry. So one of my projects too was moving out of the Bronx uh, warehouse. There was a 20,000 square foot building in the Bronx that housed the collections. And again, some of you might've been there. This was the entrance that faced out on the Bruckner Boulevard, as well as the uh, causeway. Uh, very, very noisy. I remember my first meeting there, we were in trailers and uh, made my hair stand on end. The cars going by on the causeway were so noisy and trucks and all these different things. It's also a facility because it had been built in 26 and pretty much ignored it, had some different toxins that we needed to deal with uh, inside the facility. Each of the rooms, like <clears throat> this pomo basket tree here, each of the rooms were uh, about 10 feet, uh, uh, 20 feet wide by 10 feet high, 20 feet long. And in a room that size, there were seven of those rooms, 10 by 20 by 20, uh, there were seven of those rooms. And each of those rooms had between 16,000 and 25,000 objects each. It's a terrific opportunity uh, for us in moving the collections. It was a uh, five-year project. It was uh, about 832,000 objects. There was nothing broken at all. Uh, it was really a resuscitation uh, for the collection. It really brought the collections, gave it, gave, uh, returned its breath to it, uh, returned a life to it in, in some ways. It was really quite extraordinary. I was fortunate to work with 67 or so terrific people, both in Washington and um, uh, New York. At the beginning of the project, it felt like the New York staff was pushing the collection towards Washington. And about midway through the project, the five years, it felt like the staff in Washington was pulling the collection. We had a truck a week. Uh, the trucks were divided by cultural areas, and there were several reasons for those areas. We're talking about 53 foot trucks, by the way. Uh, and we had several times, we had more than $50 million worth of value that we couldn't send that all in one truck. We built all these specialized ideas about packing and things like that. We did the first inventory of the collection. I mean, every bead was counted. There were over counts and under counts. And so it was the first true assessment of those collections. If you had been to that facility previous to the work that we were doing there and moving the collections, these little rooms, these, these 20, these 20 uh, foot wide rooms had a row of shelves along the wall and a double row in the middle. And people didn't have the heart to stuff things back in those drawers and put them in those shelving units. And so the drawers lined the aisleways and they actually then pulled out drawers and you walked on the drawers and walked down the aisles. Um, it was very extraordinary in many ways. We also did conservation, whoop, not conversation, but conservation assessments, sorry about that. And uh, what that meant, we looked at condition, we did some basic cleaning, and if something needed triage in order to move it, we did that so we stabilized the pieces in uh, New York to be moved. We did new photography of everything. We uh, created eight, 18 uh, trilobites, of, of, of images, we had an opportunity that would never come again to photograph everything. If you want to see the photographs, go online to NMAI's collections. Those are the photographs we took. We had an opportunity to photograph the textiles, which are sort of oversized. And uh, we could have used the, the table we had been using for that. Um, and it would have been at a slight angle, or we could invest uh, uh, what was then you know, a little bit of money, like a a few thousand dollars, we bought a new table and we could get a full on straight view. It was a great opportunity. We built new mounts. Uh, you see these types of mounts every place now. So we could take a piece that had been sitting on the shelf without much protection, maybe rubbing against other pieces, maybe could roll off the shelf. And what we did was we built a lot of ethylfoam mounts. And also with those mounts, what we could do was we could put something upright or we could lay it down in a certain way. We could protect its more delicate pieces. 
Uh, we also develop cultural care. Cultural care is very complicated in a big collection like this. We had for every section of the collections we moved, we have different people who came in and talked to us uh, for uh, the Plains material as an example, cultural care. We, uh, George Horse Capture and Emil, her many horses, were both within the staff, of course, and uh, Emil and uh, George talked, they talked to other people, and they decided uh, to move the uh, more culturally, they developed a series of, of rules about handling the collection, men, women, uh, keeping things together, keep, not keeping things together, the types of cultural rules someone would practice in a community. And they came down to this idea then of the uh, culturally sensitive, objects, religious or ceremonial objects that are in the collection. And they decided, like in, uh, uh, like it's done on the plains, that these pieces would be conveyed separately from the household objects and the clothing and so forth. And so we saved uh, two trucks just for those, those uh, highly culturally sensitive objects and brought them separately to Washington. There was a, a type of, uh, a uh, blessing when things left the uh, New York, uh, a blessing not uh, not specific in the sense that we didn't have people from each community to bless their community's things, but it was a blessing for the work of the people doing the work. We had the same thing in receiving the trucks in Washington, a blessing that things had arrived. Uh, and the other thing that we did with the, uh, with the move was we organized the collections. What I mean by that is we went through and we uh, put things by tribal groupings instead of anthropological groupings. And you see that today when you go to the Cultural Resources Center. And the principles we developed uh, for the center, there are three simple things that, 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 um, that we developed. It's called unprecedented access. That means that things are open and, and teaching staff uh, how to step back, allow that access to feel like it's totally open. We also talked about preservation, and the best preservation might be putting the object back into use. It may not be just staying in a dark room with the right mounts and so forth. And then at all times that the uh, staffing, uh, people in the, in the center, those working with everyone who came, respectful, responsible, and useful, uh, that our position was to facilitate and be there to help. Museum, the, the Cultural Resources Center itself is set on the directional axes. There's a welcome area, there's indoor and outdoor spaces for prayers and things like that. And you can see in this picture here, there's no hidden rooms uh, they're, they're for the collections. People felt that uh, in designing the center that things had been, uh, things were in special rooms that were hard to find and so forth. And then uh, you know, it's a home for the collection. There's a dignity about the, about the facility, which is important. And then um, there are problems with the facilities. I will say that I think the biggest problem is actually that there's just no kitchen for native people to come and no facilities to prepare and have meals together, uh, just to have a microwave, uh, it doesn't work very well. We looked at that and changing that, it was just too expensive in the end, but the staff was terrific. We were bringing a lot of people in for, and um, from different parts of the hemisphere. And if you go now, if you have gone, you know that the staff is wonderful and they'll have a potluck and other ways to bring food. The 12 foot, that's 12 feet high shelving, these units here, uh, that's a problem too. And we'll talk about it because you have to ride one of these units here to get up there. And there's little space for new acquisitions. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? Emily is pulling out a drawer. I mean, this is an extraordinary sort of circumstance. And so the drawer she pulls out, things are flat. You don't have to touch everything to see it. You can see things visually. Other people can see things. Uh, it really helps that way. You can see how tall these are. This unit's about, um, Four or so feet tall at the back end. This is about a six foot mark here, this line between the cabinets. So you've got to get on one of these units and ride around. And they're great fun, uh, but it takes a little bit of learning here. You can see she's up on one of those units. Um, kind of complicated. It's really complicated. It's a lot of fun for most people, but I think for some people, it's kind of scary to get on one of those. Maybe some older people, it's, uh, it, there were a couple um, moments, let's say. Um, so, we're getting close to the end here, and I hope uh, there's some good questions and some comments. Uh, we're walking around too. Look at these exhibits. These are all different exhibits about Native people. 
Uh, there's a lot of things, you know, this is, this is the classic one. This is actually there in Gallup. They're making a, a dry painting, you know, people over the rail looking at them. And, uh, you know, it's, gr it's great. People will do this in front of people, but this idea of demonstrating, uh, and that's the way you see people I've already mentioned, that's problematic. So maybe there's a place for programs at your facility that you're planning, but how do you plan that? What does it look like? Uh, how do you uh, change the dynamic and the agency of those things? And then these are different places. This is Montclair in New Jersey, who uh, have just redone their galleries. You can see, you know, they have a great deal of materials here. Probably, probably they work with the community. Somebody asked them to keep the bonnet separate from the other materials like this. Uh, this always brings to mind when I see this, you know, it looks like the bonnet is being protected uh, by the uh, case. Uh, uh, we had a piece like that in the Oakland Museum and a man, Wallace Burroughs, came in from one of the communities and Wallace looked at this piece that was in an case, upright case like that. And he said, it was so wonderful, you're protecting the people from that, from that ceremonial uh, uh, feathered outfit that he saw completely from the inside out, not this sort of outside idea. Uh, this is a recent exhibit at um, Yale you know, painting the walls, you know, different things, spacing things out like that. I've forgotten where this is from, this fuzzy picture, but again, this idea of how things might look, they've got a real combination of things, you know, really what communities might look like. Again, objects in cases with bonnets on the cases. And then this is a Denver Art Museum. They're all fairness, they're redoing, they're redoing this now. Uh, but um, again, this idea of scattered objects and so forth. And so how does this, Again, I go back to my essential question, how does this feel? Does this feel like your community? Is this the way you want people to think about you? Those are the questions I think in going through these facilities. Now, I know it's hard to get out with COVID right now and so forth, but it's amazing what's online and what you can do with Google in terms of looking for exhibitions and so forth and finding things and, and maybe having a, a a virtual meeting with your committees and so forth and begin to discuss some of these things. So um, let's talk about planning just for a minute. Uh, you know, it's really got to be this inclusive planning and you've got to do some work before the architects and planners arrive. You've got to build agreement and consensus. You know, it's a cultural facility. We understand that, okay, we're going to build this cultural facility here, you know, on our lands. Uh, you know, where's that site for that? What does the site say? Uh, you know, if you put it out by the road, that's how people know you put it inside the community, maybe it's intrusive. Uh, different communities have used cultural centers to control the outside world. Other use it to educate the outside world. Other places use it for um, language and culture preservation and learning uh, and retention. So um, there's all these different things and those are the types of things that need to be discussed. Is it going to have collections? Are there going to be rooms for people to work in? Are you going to grow those collections once they arrive? Are you going to have archives? Are you going to have paper and photographs in the collections or maybe not? Uh, and is it going to have a library? What type of library will it have? Who will the library serve? Um, and are there exhibitions? Uh, and who are the exhibitions for? And it's educational. Okay, that's a very good thing. Uh, for who? And tribal members are outsiders. So if you don't have these types of things, you could get something like this where you have wearing blankets sitting on the floor on these trays, or you can have something like this, which is not at all like, like this particular type of feather cape is worn, but it shows it as a, as a garment for warmth rather than a garment uh, for dance. So uh, all things, all sorts of things could happen if you're not talking. So in the planning part, these are the sort of stages in terms of uh, now you've walked through these facilities, you have an idea of, um, what, you, uh, what you've seen. When we were planning for the Here, Now, and Always exhibition in Santa Fe, we traveled as a group to different exhibitions. And uh, we were in uh, uh, a particular exhibition for a museum that everybody thought was so wonderful. And uh, one of our primary <laughs> curators, uh, Rena Swensel, looked at it. She looked at the exhibit as we were leaning on the rail and looking at this uh, map of the Southwest. And she said, that, well, now we know what we're not going to do. Uh, I thought that was a terrific moment. Uh, and we worked, it took us from that moment of Rena saying that, 
know, it took a long time and a lot of discussion to come to what was, what are some of the alternatives. So that's what I'm stressing here is for you all to take visiting other places, your knowledge of other places, and, and use what you like. Make it yours, but use what you like, make it your own, but also take those intangible feelings and think about, wow, that made me just anxious to be in that space, or wow, I didn't like that at all. And try and begin to articulate through this process of planning, the vision, the mission, the strategic plan, um, what those intangibles and intangibles are. And you can't enter a room with the planner, so you've hired someone now. The planners come in. You've hired someone. And you can't expect him to help you decide uh, what your center will do. Because if you don't have some decision-making completed already, what the planners will do, because that's their practice, is they'll try and reach a consensus for you. They'll try and work people in the room together uh, so you can reach consensus and you can move forward. That's what they do. That's their work. There's nothing inherently uh, uh, bad about that, but they might come to a place that's not really what you wanted uh, because they're trying to resolve uh, differences of opinion, whereas that resolution of difference of opinion need to be somewhat set in the community before anybody from the outside can come in. Um, so with pre-planning, like we're talking about, right, you've got to agree, uh, you've got to set up priorities, you've got to agree on the need for this cultural center museum. And you have to agree about the functions of it. You have to agree education, outside, inside worlds, uh, bring collections back, not bring collections back. Where is the supervised and tribal government? This is probably um, a key uh, to a lot of things I see going on now, uh, where uh, some of the museums are supervised by the enterprises, tribal enterprises, uh, meaning that it's with the supermarket and the gas station, the casino, the hotel. So you have economic people over a cultural facility. That can be problematic, let's say. Uh, it can also be that the uh, chair or the governor uh, and, and, the, and the leadership want to govern it day to day. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a complicated too. So you've got to get this idea someplace talked about. The site selection I've already mentioned, if you're out by the road, is what people think, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that's how you're represented and so forth. That's what they see. Uh, and who does the cultural center serve? Again, the same questions I've been asking again and again. And then you go into design to build it. The design development is the next stage. And you're developing then a schematic of the space. It's like the, the circle drawing, right? You're working together and you've got these circles, the relationship of the spaces, the collection space, to the exhibit space, the office space, to the private cultural spaces. And this is, again, where you begin to think deeply about uh, the places that you've seen. And again, I, I know I've said this too many times already, but go, what did you like? What didn't you like? Though Both of those are equal. And so I put this great exhibition up here. Uh, there's not much to like here except, wow, I like those objects. I like those baskets a lot. I wish we had those baskets back at home. Um, other than, other, than, other than that, you know, there's not a whole lot to like uh, from one reason or another. So figuring that out, you know, talking about that. Is your space going to have private spaces for cultural practice? Is, is it going to bring back, is this a place you're going to house your NAGPRA uh, repatriations, uh, library and archives, education function, office spaces? So again, going back to this beginning slide, the idea of... Um, Going back and the idea that uh, what's in the museum, uh, importance to your planning, you know, what's the cultural values? What are your cultural values and principles in your community? How do you talk about those values as a community? And where do you see those values? And how can you put those values somehow into practice in planning the museum, developing the museum, and operating the museum? doesn't mean you're revealing everything about the community, but there are certain things, there are certain principles and ways that the respectfulness perhaps is things like that to, that your community has. It also you know, extends to the objects. There's certain types of things you'll show, certain types of things you won't show. It extends to the things you'll say, 
what you won't say, what, you, what questions you'll answer, what you won't answer, how you answer the question of someone uh, that you're not really going to answer. I mean, all those types of things. And those, all those things come up in the um, planning stages. Believe it or not, uh, you're standing in the middle of facilities 10 years from now, and that planning, I hope, was good enough that it foresaw 10 years uh, from that time and, uh, and, and created enough about your values because your values and principles in the community are steady. They're, they're not changing it's the foundation it's the core of your community sure people might drive to to a dance now or or have a telephone or whatever it is people photograph certain things and so forth there's lots of changes around the periphery but that core of things is going to be the same so finding that core uh being able to articulate that core in a way it doesn't uh um, offend the core or or violate your own principles about the privacy of that core. And finding that core, maintaining that core, finding how other places like museums, other cultural museums, other tribal museums and cultural centers, how have they um, managed that core themselves? And final slide, I showed you this slide a couple of weeks ago. I just wanna go back and again, encourage you to look at the uh, guidelines for collaboration uh, um, at, at guidelinesforcollaboration.info. I think these guidelines developed for museums and developed for communities are very thoughtful. There are lots and lots of people from around the country involved in writing these guidelines. I, I think they're, they're really well done and, and important for, for people to look at as a way to think about um, the types of practices museums once had, what they're striving towards, and what your tribal museum and or cultural center can be, how you can be innovative, how you can be forward thinking, and create something that surprises people, not just in the building. Uh, this is critical. I'm sorry. I apologize. A lot, of, a lot of tribal centers are very beautiful, and they put a lot of the cultural principles into the beauty of the building. Um, and I think that's important. People get that idea. But what goes on inside? That, that is really what we're kind of talking about today. Less about the building and so forth, but more about the inside of what it looks like. I'm going to stop sharing. And then um, I hope there's some questions and comments. Okay. That worked? Did I stop sharing? Yep, it worked. Okay. So I hope there's some 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 comments uh, and questions about things. Yeah, who was which museum or tribe was it that you said tore down their existing cultural center and build a whole new building? Did I say that? Oh dear. Hey, you did. <laughs> um, Early in the presentation. Yeah, early in the presentation. Boy, I'm now confused. Um, well, I have to think about it. I'm sorry. I, I, there are places like Acoma, they had, they had a building they had built in the 80s with, with equal opportunity funds. And then that burned down. They built, then they had two trailers and they have facilities they have now. Um, you know, uh, um, wow, I'm stuck. Sorry. Sorry, Tim. Tim, is there yeah, a reason? Yeah, there could pop. With our planning, we might possibly go that direction. I don't think so. We're looking at it, re renovating and expanding and adding on. But if the planning indicates that we need something entirely different, um, then we might have to go that way. But I was, uh, when he said that, I thought, oh, I'd like to know who that is. Yeah. Um, why somebody suggested maybe with Southern Utes. I don't, I don't, they had a facility that was like a old building, like an old government building, cinder block, just you can picture it. And they did tear that down to build, build a new facility. Um, so that's, that's an example of that. And I think having the, um, forward thinking to tear down an existing building, if that's possible in your project, 
I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that um, if it doesn't fit your needs and you have the funding and you have the community wherewithal to, to tear down something, rebuild something, um, I, I think that that is, um, that's very, very good. Sean, do you have thoughts? Yeah, um, I've had the great pleasure of working with Bruce recently at the, at the Co Center here in Santa Fe. And um, your experience, Bruce, is, is uh, magnificent between MIAC and NMAI and the Co, um, all of which are cultural centers or museums dealing with a, a variety of, of tribes and cultures. Um, the, the cohort communities here are, are looking to build mm -hmm. facilities specific to their own tribe. Uh, and community, um, what what lessons did you learn from, from these other facilities that are kind of um, more more shared? Uh, that what really stands out is the difference between a facility for one community and one for many. That's a that's a really good question, Sean. Um, and there was I did talk about you reminded me we tore down half of my act to rebuild it because we didn't feel that uh, the arts culture in Santa Fe, we tore, we tore down and added to it. We didn't feel it really responsibly reflected native communities. So that's what we did. It was an Ed Mazaria building, Sean. It was all Which fun. museum was that then? That was Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And who runs that? That is a state museum. It's not a tribal museum. Okay. So that was sort of, I must have thrown in, we tore down half of the building somewhere in there as an aside. Uh, but again, the Southern Youth tore down that building. The Acoma, uh, Acoma toward, essentially, they had a fire in a building. They perhaps could have rebuilt that building, but they tore it down to build a new building and plan a new building. And you see that, I think you see that too. There's a, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what your facility looks like now, uh, but you know, a lot of museums end up in, in old government buildings and so forth. Um, and I, and I think that can be uh, not conducive to what you might want to do in that building. Plus it doesn't feel like your own space. As far as uh, Sean's question about specific things, I think what I'm asking people to do, Sean, is um, walk through these other places, tribal museums, tribal cultural centers, uh, these other museums, the NMAI, local museums in Phoenix, wherever they might be, in in and uh, Victoria, BC, uh, you know wherever those places are to walk through them, and again to take hold of what you're feeling as you're walking through them. Uh, they have some of the same things you're working on in your planning, which is uh, public spaces, private spaces, collections, education. Who's your audience? Who's your constituents? Those are questions you ask in any construction project. So that's what I'm urging. But to walk through and be both, and be hypercritical, I guess is what I'm saying. Not, not to just uh, uh, walk through and like the way the doors work in the, in the loading dock and want those doors, but why do you like those doors? What is about those doors that make you feel like it's, like it's native? We were walking around, when we were planning the Poe Center. We went down to Albuquerque, went to the art museum and the way the loading dock uh, worked at the art museum still works, it's in a tunnel. It's a very, it's a very confined space. I remember standing there with the group and everybody was just wanted to get out of there. So that was a really good thing that happened in the sense that it made people uncomfortable. So that's kind of how we're answering that, uh, Sean. Thank you. Um, All right, what other questions do we have? I just had a quick question for Sean that might help Tim. Is, is there a way that you can evaluate whether an older building is going to serve your needs and if it should be mm, replaced? Question. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there, there's, two, there's two fundamentally different analyses that need to be done. I think what um, Bruce has touched on both of them. One is, you know, does the facility speak to your culture and the way that you understand your place? Um, and a second is um, e equally important, but very, very different. You know, can 
can we, and depending on, on the needs of, of whether it's a museum or a cultural center and your, your uh, ambitions for achieving a kind of a conservation environment with temperature and humidity control, um, that can be often very difficult to do um, in, in existing buildings. And this is, gonna, this is gonna depend wildly on where your climate, where, where your community is and the severity of, of the, of the uh, climate there and the temperature and humidity swings. In some places, this is not a big deal at all. And in other places, it's very, very challenging. Um, and you're, you, in an existing building, you're, you're, when you're introducing climate systems like that, you can, you can damage the building if you're not careful. Um, and you can also create conditions that, that, that cause problems and challenges for the, for the artifacts and the collections. Um, so it's really a twofold uh, examination as well as a financial one does it sometimes it sometimes it is in fact um, cheaper to start from scratch and sometimes it's not but it, <laughs> yeah. um, it depends that's the truth I've been through this recently um, and uh, it depends there's a million factors that, that come into play in, in that um, so I think you, that, also, you have to budget for the demolition demolition of the old building if you're building a new one absolutely and, and that has materials that go along with that demolition um, I've got to run. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. thanks, Bruce. That was great. Oh, thanks very much. The demolition might be less expensive than the remodel. And some of the problems that Sean is talking about, the co-center has bought a building. We're basically going to rebuild the building around the existing building. Um, it won't be quite as much as building from start, um, but maybe in a smaller circumstance. And I, and I think, again, um, I, I really think there are a lot of people and facilities around that have talked about or conquered some of these same problems that you might have or might experience. And, to, and I guess what I'm urging you is to use people's experiences uh, to find out um, to find out what, what types of solutions are out there. I think there's, there's very good solutions out there. I don't know if there are any other questions or comments. I just wanted to say thanks, uh, Bruce. That was a great pleasure. Sure. I've been able to take a, a tribal museum studies course, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. And oh, I good. Was, um, I learned a lot, you know. But the other thing is I've been able to attend um, a Tom's conferences and visit places. So it is. It's inspiring. And it's also being able to hear from the people who work there and who were part of the construction or the creation of, of their facility. It's so meaningful because you can hear the, the um the concerns regarding how to show dignity to these pieces that were not respected for years, how to bring yeah. them home, how to put them in a respectful place, and how to let them live again within their community. So yes. you know, I'm, I'm really excited for our opportunity. Um, from where we are, we're a small tribe, Port Gabbles, Glallam, we're located in Kingston, Washington. Um, is in place we already have a location we have um we know we're going to build new you know we have a couple things done um but there's still so much planning and, and knowing the steps to take and i that's why i so much appreciate all of these uh, zoom meetings and webinars because they're helping us figure out the structure of step one step two step three <laughs> um but when you were talking about being able to look through the collections and i'm it's sounding like we're probably not going to be able to do our tours <laughs> so, yeah right Julie. I think the thing I was really looking forward to, because when we filled out, we had these um, we had two collections that we were sent to identify pieces that we'd like to look at if we get to visit the facility. And the thing that I was looking forward to is being able to read that additional research that's collected and perhaps saved in the archives on pieces, on objects. Yes. That's what the archives does. A lot of times there'll be a letter that's associated with an object and it has all the details, the behind the scenes stuff. Right. That's what I was really looking forward to. So if we can't visit these locations and talk to somebody face to face, um, who do we reach out to? We, do we just contact like their collections manager? Is that to help yeah. find that research material? Yeah, I I think that's a I think that's a very good question, and we're unfortunately in the middle of this COVID uh, pandemic, and we have to adapt. We've already adapted ourselves clearly. Um, the cohort was going, as you say, was going to meet in Washington, the meetings in November, everything is more or less on hold. And I think that 
the virtual meetings are wonderful, but they have some limitations. And uh, I, I, if you want to see the collections, I don't know if the collections managers in the building, but they could go down the aisle with their phone, if nothing else, and show you the collections that way. There might be things online. I think it's important to look online. You can look through different databases online and see what there is. Um, there is a real limit, though, to how far you can go at this point, and you know that already. Yeah. Um, I just go as far as you can. Looked at, you know, go through the other sources. Uh, look at Library of Congress. Look at Google Google Scholar. You know, look for books. You know, read do the do the secondary reading, so you understand what people have said about your community. Maybe at this point, uh, and then when things open back up, which we all hope will be soon, uh, then you'll be prepared in another way to see those collections, like reading that card, reading that catalog card, and knowing what those names, and knowing what Julius Karlsbach's name means on that, um, uh, and knowing who he is and what he did and so forth. So there is some research you can do in the meantime, uh, but I agree, it's really hard not being out in collections and those types of things. We have asked for a year's extension, so the program will extend beyond when we anticipated it would end. And we're hoping that we will be able to make that trip because it is important. Yeah. And yeah. So we're doing everything possible to to make that happen for you. Um, and, and if everything's open in September, we'll, we'll do it, but we kind of doubt that that's going to happen. Yeah. But, but with the added time, we'll, we'll just see what the future brings. Yeah. Well, everybody, everybody is... Um... All the organizations you know, we work with normally have extended things like FIPO, the Travel Historic Preservation Funds, which are usually September to September period, got to use them, uh, say go back, have been extended for a year. So there's just lots of stuff on the horizon. People are being lenient uh, in wonderful ways. So I hope, I hope that everybody is towards this wonderful program. It does set back um, people's planning in ways but maybe there's some other work, maybe there's some other community meeting stuff. Maybe you can't even get together as communities. So maybe there's not even that at this point, uh, but there's other things that can happen. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing, just kind of briefly, we're working on, a, uh, I'm working uh, on this book project in, in, in San Francisco. It's a donated collection and there's ancestral pottery, ancestral Pueblo pottery. We have a small group of, of uh, leadership who have been coming helping with us. And uh, you know, we can't meet in person, so I, I mentioned this at the very beginning of the conversation, but I was really thrilled to hear, uh, to hear them say, you know, ver this, this virtual meeting is a new normal. We can do a cultural consultation virtually. Uh, that that's just the way we're working now. That, and it's actually, and the other thing the person said was it's so refreshing to, to be working on these things you know, in the virtual world, in the sense that everything else is so uh, COVID-based and uh, difficult, whereas this cultural thing was more about the continuity of, of people. Okay. Anybody else? Are we? Okay, well. Thank you, Bruce. That was yeah. wonderful, Thank as you. always. Oh, thanks. thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. I wish we were walking through a facility and talking as we went. Um, but uh, another time. Thank you. We will. Bye. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.